Hi there, welcome to this CNCF webinar. I'm really delighted to talk to you today about open source security. This is Charmed Kubernetes and Kubescape for the best in class of Kubernetes security. And I hope over the next 25 to 30 minutes, we can talk you through some of the landscape around security, some of the challenges that you face in Kubernetes especially, and some of the solutions, and really bring to light why we think that Kubescape and Charm Kubernetes are really good partners in helping you with your open source security needs. But before we get there, let me just introduce who we are. My name is Alex. I am the director of Kubernetes at Canonical, Canonical being the company behind Ubuntu, which might sound familiar. And I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit today about my experiences as both the engineering and the product leader in that space and why something like Kubescape is so important to us. Hello, everyone. My name is, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is David Wartenthal. I am a lead maintainer of Kubescape. I work and a uh, team lead at Armo. Um, so as you can understand, I am uh, one of the developers of Kubescape. Uh, with us over here, there's also Vlad, who is also uh, with, he's a colleague of mine from Armo and also a uh, lead maintainer of Kubescape. Thank you so much. So let's get straight into it. Security for Kubernetes is overwhelming because of a few reasons. People are learning a new topology. It's on top of Linux. And also, it really is distributed Linux, right? And so a lot of these concepts that people don't really brush up on for five, 10 years after school come back to haunt them when they're thinking about a container, a pod, a namespace, you know, root privileges. What does all this really mean? And so some of the challenges are that you have not only the education piece, You've got DevOps engineers who want to help you go faster, to build pipelines, to provision, to deploy. You have security professionals who are trying to stop this and to look at the threat and risk models for deploying into the wild. And then you have end users who are voraciously trying to consume this stuff. So it's super challenging to have a security tool or platform that can meet all of those needs and to help all of those professionals get what they need out of it. And so today, if we were trying to think about distilling this, into a few security problems, I think it would be these that you can see on the screen. Many security tools are difficult to use. I think of some of the proprietary ones that I've had to use in the past, and the results come out in many different formats. Often the recommendations from tooling will be an Excel sheet that you'll have to digest, um, or maybe they will be oh, that's proprietary, right? That scoring is only relevant to that tool. That kind of bleeds into the next point, which is that they're fragmented, right? You have tools that are all over the space in terms of where they actually touch. Lots of tooling around images these days for OCI images, lots of scanners around specific uh, spaces where you can think about, is this image from a certain registry? But there aren't tools that tend to be generalists. And the tools that are generalists don't tend to work in a, in a depth across all of the different segments in a similar way. And so people find themselves thinking, well, do I need this? Do I need this? And you know, with that proprietary angle, it makes it even more complicated. I got to spend $80,000 a year just so I have a suite of tools that can do all the things I need. And finally, once you've got all those tools, well, do they actually detect if my, if my manifest has a misconfiguration, right? Or am I just looking at if my Linux kernel has the latest modules? And so there's a gap naturally in that area. If we were to try and put that all together into perhaps three key themes, I think it would be the following. Hardening around the actual node of Kubernetes, right? And at the packages, at the file system, of the way that you're able to interact with that system is a super important challenge. And that's what many of these tools look to give you an assessment of. CICD, so the actual provisioning and distribution of software on top of Linux, on top of Kubernetes, is fraught with um, attack vectors, right? Anything from man in the middle to poison registry attacks. Being able to actually provision the right thing onto the right node and you know where it came from and the provenance of that is extremely compelling. And the last thing is, how do you do all of the above plus being able to say that your regulators can come in and see you've got an audit log and your FIPS compliant, your CIS compliant, you follow the latest NSA hardening guidelines. So it's an absolute head spin of how do you get anywhere near being uh, successful with, with security for Kubernetes because it's, it's super challenging and it's a real landmine and minefield. So how does open source play into this? Well, open source is often at the bleeding edge of innovation because people are able to explore ideas without there being a commercial incentive necessarily. And so when we think about why has open source been powerful, think about why has Linux or why has Kubernetes been powerful? Because it gets inertia behind it and because bad ideas are often pruned and good ideas are often grown. 
And so that's why we like to think that with Charmcase and with Cubescape, we've got a marriage of two very important open source products that can come to give you this solution for security. I want to take you very quickly through what Charm Kubernetes is. The TLDR of this is it's upstream Kates plus an operator lifecycle management system, right? It's, it's all the bells and whistles of conformant Kates and all that jazz, and we keep it all up to date. It's got CVEs that are automatically squashed, and we roll out revisions nightly, right? Your Kates goes and runs, and let's say there's a critical um, CVE in etcd, you automatically get that fixed. You do nothing. It also you know, runs on top of secured Ubuntu as part of this stack, so you get live patching on the kernel. Not many people can boast that, if any. And then all this blurb and text you see here are all the other bells and whistles that we do that many other companies um, compete in that space against. But the thing that I think is the differentiator is really our story about how we get packages to you in your Kates cluster. You'll hear me talk about Juju a few times. Juju is effectively our provisioning and operator lifecycle management system, but we also support Cappy, and we're also looking at other ways to bring Kubernetes to you in the format that suits you best. In terms of that story I mentioned a moment ago, right? in terms of like those three pillars, how the heck does any of this stuff relate? Well, the hardening aspect from what I think about is can Canonical works very hard to make open source accessible. And so what we do is we're now starting to think about, well, FIPS shouldn't be something that's just for proprietary use only. Let's harden Kubernetes with FIPS. What does that actually mean? FIPS means that you need to have certain crypto libraries inside your Golang build engines and your runtime of Kubernetes so that the, um, the cryptographic hashes that it's creating match the FIPS hardening guide. So we, we're doing that. This year, we're releasing FIPS hardened microcates. Great. How do we think about CICD? Juju allows you to have consistent multi-cloud CICD approaches. In fact, Juju really works more on the reconciliation base than the CICD push base. And what's really nice about using Juju is you have consistency across clouds. So way less misconfiguration comes in there. And then the last thing around governance and compliance is coming back to that angle of, do you have accreditation? Ubuntu is accredited in many different ways, you know, ISO, uh, FIPS certified, et cetera. And we're starting to bring that into Kates now. So NCSC, um, for those who aren't familiar, is the National Crime Agency in the UK. We've just gone through a review with them, as well as other organizations across the world to make sure that we're, that we're pulling in the highest standards possible. So that, in a nutshell, is why I think Charmed Kubernetes is interesting. And let's move on to Cubescape and let David speak a bit to that. All right, so I'll take it forward from here. And then we would also explain exactly how the two uh, beautiful products can integrate in a seamless way. So what is Cubescape? Where did we start from? Um, so I'll give you a really quick recap. Uh, what happens is that as uh, Alex explained the, the three different uh, uh, main uh, dr driven points that drive us over here is there, there, are not, there, are many, there are many tools out there. Not all of them uh, work, uh, know how to solve all the problems. And a lot of them have a, a lot of different holes in them. So we came with Cubescape uh, with an idea of having a single tool that would that's built for developers, built, that is built for DevOps, uh, which means it's easy to use, uh, easy to integrate with, and that it covers your pipeline from the development from the VS from the as a VS Code extension uh, through the CI, which means with GitHub Actions or Circle CI or other, and also in your cluster with a CLI tool and also with the Helm chart you can uh, install in your cluster. Um, next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So, and now Cubescape really comes to answering that on, on uh, multiple questions, but uh, what we really, uh, we point out over here is uh, we, first of all, we give you the best practices. So if you want to be compliant, we have NSA, we have MITRE scanning, uh, CIS benchmark. We show you where are you related uh, regarding other, uh, other of your clusters and how compliant are you with these, uh, with these different frameworks. Uh, we also, Cubescape can also show you, um, uh, can identify and also can prevent uh, some uh, security drifts, that means uh, Cubescape will tell you if you right now published a uh, new namespace or resources with more security issues uh, than you had before. So Cubescape will notify you on such things. And 
in general, we have over here a continuous uh, Kubernetes hardening, um, which we can give you, we, uh, Cubescape gives you remediation advice of how to fix your issues. Um, you can also scan uh, re uh, recurring scans. That means not only once a year or only when you uh, deploy your, your components, but also once a day or once a week, uh, et cetera. So if there are any new CVEs, uh, Kipskip would right away detect it and alert the users about it. Awesome. Thank you, David. And I suppose as we come on to this um, question of how do these projects merge together, it's important to take a step back and think about what I mentioned a moment ago around that whole operator lifecycle management piece. We think about operators as charms at, um, at Canonical. And these charms are open source, and they're effectively little Python packages that wrap around whatever you might have. So you might have an existing Helm chart. You might have an existing set of manifests. Or it might be something more basic, such as just a customized script. What charms that you do is write hooks into that, right? So on create, on delete, et cetera. And that behavior, you could say it's the same as Cube Builder, right? Cube Builder does that too. But where charms differentiate themselves is that they are data-driven and that the charms expose interfaces to each other. So we could potentially have an Nginx charm and relate that to the Cubescape charm and add capabilities for it to say, oh, I know what you do. I'm going to add it a watch on your ingress, or I'm going to do X, Y, Z. So charms are a way of building effectively um, data-controlled operators that have um, their entire lifecycle management. But also what they do, and I think this is from our perspective why it was interesting to collaborate, is they let you go fast, right? The charms are completely tailored and they are couture in the sense that we know the charm will always work. It's like when you do snap install, cube control, you basically know that 99.999% of time that should work or install Docker with app and Debian. You know that that works. And if it doesn't, something's pretty wrong. And so we do the same approach with this and it's kind of low ops. And that's really um, where we're coming from here. In terms of what I want to hear from, from ours, I'd be really interested to know, David, from your perspective, you know, how do you think about Cubescape as a charm? What do you think of sort of the things of why that's useful to end users? Yeah, so it, it actually really comes together uh, pretty nicely because that also, also with Cubescape, uh, we look at it in a lot of uh, ways as something that we want to install out of the box. As I uh, mentioned before, that it's built for DevOps. That means we don't want the DevOps to start struggling over here. Um, uh, calling support or having uh, uh, dedicated you know, opening tickets for uh, support tickets. Um, we want this really to work out of the box and it should work out of the box and coming, uh, connecting this with Charm would give it a, a very nice boost towards that uh, direction. So if you're already working with Char uh, Charm or that you want to work with Charm and you also want to work with Cubescape, uh, these two things, uh, these two, um, these two products can uh, go together uh, really good. So one of the ways that um, when I think about this, I was before this webinar, sort of trying to draw this out and visualize how these things work together. It's very clear when you put it into something like uh, an illustration here. So the orange components, if you think about those as charmed cates, and you think of the blue as Cubescape, they're complementary, right? So charmed cates gives you sort of the guarantee of, of hardening on your cluster, updating packages, and kind of being the person that's responding to a lot of the things that, that Cubescape is going to point out to you. What's really interesting is where um, Cubescape comes in and provides you that value. David, it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit more around one of the things I've highlighted here is security gating. Like, Why is security gating useful in the CICD? Yes. So, so first of all, it's a, you know, there's always the obvious answer, which is Every, uh, th there's this very known slide, I would say, that every hour of developer is the, uh, like in the development phase, and it's another 10 hours in the testing phase, and then another 100 hours in the production phase. So when you try solving your issues, obviously in production, or when you start looking into security hardening um, in production, you're gonna spend much more time on it, uh, whether because that you have uh, different Helm charts with different uh, values, et cetera, that you would now need to track back to the origin of them uh, or from various different reasons. Uh, so if you have this uh, built correctly as a CI CD pipeline, uh, it, it would save you a lot of time. And this is really where things come together over here with uh, having it the first uh, for setting up uh, your security from level one, from when you start developing it. Uh, and again, through the pipeline, 
and again, uh, securing your applications and uh, being compliant also when you run in your production systems. And that makes a lot of sense because I think, as you say, catching it early and shifting left is a critical way of actually making sure you don't extrapolate the amount of time that gets wasted. But also you've got this other side of things as well, which is the active scanning. And in the diagram, of course, it shows things like artifact images, but that's not all, is it? You also have sort of misconfigurations and active scanning in terms of what's going on in that cluster. Can you speak a little to that? Right. So so it's not so we focus, Keepskip would focus mainly on the application, uh, on the application side of it, I would say. Um, so Keepscape would not only scan your images for CVEs, et cetera, uh, but Keepscape would also scan your, your configurations, your YAML files, et cetera, for misconfigurations. Um, Keepscape would also scan if you're running in a, um, using cloud providers, et cetera. So Keepscape would also uh, uh, take a look into those uh, configurations. Again, CIS, if we look at the CIS uh, frameworks, so uh, we need that support as well. Um, so yes, so definitely you need the you obviously need the infrastructure that would be a good and protected uh, infrastructure, but also the application. You need to make sure that your application is also following the uh, guidelines of and the hardening of the different security uh, frameworks out there. And that and that's where it gets quite interesting because you mentioned CIS, and so for example, let's see there's a, there could be a CIS control that's failing uh, because the manifest is doing something. Um, that shouldn't be, you know, it might be doing some sort of privileged thing on the host. That's where we try to also meet uh, in the orange boxes here by making sure the host itself is hardened. So you're kind of really squashing any opportunity for there to be uh, an attack vector. And I think that's a really nice um, illustration of where these two things come together successfully. Yeah. So we've we've spoken a little bit about kind of the why um, and and the, the how. It's It's important now to look at sort of the you know, let's get started with this. And one of the things that was really exciting was because Charm Hub has become the de facto way of getting your, um, your, your, your operators and getting your charms, it makes it very easy for anyone in the world to just do effectively a one-liner install. And so I was really excited when Cubescape um, was published onto Charm Hub because as we'll see in a moment, it makes actually fetching it from anywhere super easy. And just to talk a little bit around this, um, you'll see you see things like stable five, et cetera. Charm Hub supports a similar theory to Snap, um, where you have channels and you can put an edge release, you can put a stable release, you could put a dev release, and you could even say, hey, this is something specifically for that that architecture. And so I think what we're trying to do is again coming back to that idea of low ops and zero ops. We want Cubescape to be on clusters that all of our end users are running because we see an immense benefit there. And by lowering that bar to entry, just like we do with things like microcase, is that People will be like, yeah, I'm going to check that out. I'm going to try that and see how it works. And then they'll start to engage with the team at Cubescape and engage with us say, hey, yeah, I found this thing. How's that working? So that's what gets me excited, is to think about all those end users that are now available to reach. So with all our talking, um, maybe what we should do now is to hand over to Vlad to, uh, to give us a bit of a demo. Sound good? Yeah, sure. Hi, I'm Vlad. I will be taking over with a demo, and I will be presenting my screen now. So as Alex mentioned, we distribute Cubescape uh, as a charm, and it is available on charmhub.io slash Cubescape. To install the charm, the only thing that you need to do is to uh, deploy Juju, have it set up with your cloud, and follow the instructions we provide in the chart. So in the chart, I'm sorry. Uh, so I have uh, Juju deployed already. I am running a microgate uh, cluster locally. And I will right now bootstrap a controller that talks, uh, that connects Juju to my local microcates. To do this, I run a simple command uh, Juju bootstrap microcates with the name of the controller. And um, it should bootstrap the controller for me. So Juju will be able uh, to talk to the cloud, uh, manage its models, and uh, perform any uh, operations necessary for your deployment. This takes some time, but it's generally quite quick. Just while we're doing that, it's quite um, important to mention that uh, you've got at the top there, you can see you've got several different controllers. And that's because 
typically a way somebody might use Juju would be to talk to several different clouds and different clusters and models within those clouds. And so I think that one of the things that is kind of a, um, I guess a hurdle when you're learning is to get into that mindset of Juju effectively has these almost like bastions that you can connect to and, and work with. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. And as you can see, I've leveraged already multiple controllers to um, apply my models uh, in across multiple clouds. So this was very convenient. But right now, moving on with the Cubescape, uh, we, uh, I have already deployed the controller. And uh, right now, if I go back to the documentation, uh, we would see that we are required to create models. And models are uh, generally uh, the things that encapsulate your applications. So right now we would add a model for Cubescape. And this is just one simple command away from you. So as you can see, uh, the model has been created. And right now we are good to create, uh, create an application to deploy Cubescape itself. So for that, we just copy the command. And there is one thing to keep in mind is that when deploying the command, I am running on microcades. So I will be changing the command from the documentation to accommodate for microcades. And then you will also need to provide your account ID, uh, which is distributed via the Armor platform. Excuse me, I gotta check where I got that. Oh yeah, right. So you have to sign up uh, for the Armo platform, which is the SaaS offering of Cubescape. Right now, you can see I have my NFT account. So I'm copying the ID. And we're. Excuse me. And it's important to mention this is completely free to do, right? That anybody can sign up and create an account. Absolutely. Creating an account is free. And uh, you should be able to use Cubescape whenever you have one. So right now we are deploying uh, de deploying the Cubescape charm. And oh, when it deploys, it automatically runs uh, a scan of your cluster. And uh, given the provided account ID, it will connect uh, the account result, uh, the scan results to your uh, Cubescape, plat uh, the Armel platform account. So you will be able to see the results in uh, all their glory in the SaaS. Uh, and re review them, uh, take a look at uh, your uh, configurations or misconfigurations that you might have, uh, CVEs and whatnot. So as you can see in the status, uh, the Cubescape application is deploying. Um, right now it's performing some of it. Uh, it's uh, Juju Zero Ops Magic. Uh, we are installing the Charm uh, software inside of our model. And right now when you see no message, it means that Cubescape has been successfully installed and uh, it's already performing its security thing. So thank you, that's it for me. I will be handing it over to David. Yes, so I'll be taking it from Vlad. Vlad, thank you very much for the demonstration of how to install. And now I would go a little bit through the different, uh, the different views you can see on the Armor, Armo portal. So what Vlad just uh, 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 scanned right now, the cluster he just scanned, I don't know if you noticed, but he called it DW. Thank you, Vlad. Uh, so here are the results um, from uh, 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 Vlad's uh, scanning. Um, as you can tell, this takes, a, it can take around half a minute to a minute for the scans to appear. And the uh, Armo Protal, it depends on the size of the cluster, but it's relatively quick. Um, now, what we're looking at right now is the Armour Portal. Over here, we can see basically everything that you do with Cubescape, whether if you do it from uh, your CI CD or that uh, you run it as a C as Cubescape as a CLI or Cubescape as a Helm chart. Again, we want to have a single plane of glass for everything uh, for your full pipeline. So we're going to take a look into the config scanning, which is the configuration scanning. Um, and I will show you. Um, a very quick, uh, a, a quick tour over here of what how it looks like. So first of all, you could look at the different uh, frameworks that we have the CIS. Uh, you can also follow up with the NSA framework or with the Mitra framework, whichever one you prefer. Um, and let's say if we take the, the NSA framework and we see over here the different controls that uh, failed with the NSA framework and the cluster that Vlad just ran. 
Um, for example, in the NSA, there's a control name risk resource limits. That means um, that cluster is missing, uh, the uh, workload is missing uh, uh, resources limits. As you can tell, as you can tell, uh, they all, all my workloads have a resource, uh, uh, almost all of them have uh, limits. Uh, the cube system are excluded because obviously this is something that you have nothing to do about. But for this demonstration, we wanted to uh, show you a little bit how it looks like. Um, so KubeScape will show you exactly how and where you need to fix. So um, to tell you that you need to add over here the resource limits, the CPU and the memory. And uh, once you do this, next time you would scan your components with KubeScape, uh, you would see these uh, this control would pass on this resource. There's also a tooltip over here explaining how to, uh, why is this and how you should change these values in your original deployment. So this this actually works out of the box. It's uh, it's nice. It's fun to use, and it's relatively easy. Another thing we have, as Vlad demonstrated, so this is the configuration scanning. We also scan uh, the images for CVEs. So you have uh, you can have different CVEs in your uh, system. Um, I'll actually take over here the CVE. Uh, you can take a look at the different CVEs that we, we detected. Uh, you can also exclude CVEs if you wish to exclude. Uh, we show you if there's a fix available for that. And you can also, uh, if there is a fix, you can also sort and um, and filter based on that. Uh, we also, and this is generally the, uh, the, the, the views you can see uh, related to the Helm chart uh, installation. Uh, there's another thing that we did that Vlad did not demonstrate, but I will just uh, show a sneak peek of that. It's also, we, uh, KubeScape can also scan registries and uh, registries and also repositories. So we'll take a quick look at the repositories. So as we're speaking at the CI CD, uh, as you can tell, you can scan your GitHub, uh, Azure, Bitbucket, GitLab, et cetera. Um, and this, this way you can really have one place showing you uh, all of your different issues. Uh, that's it. Alex, now it's back to you. Thank you so much. Let me just uh, share my screen again. I think it's a wonderfully um, good pairing. And I think the thing that I wanted to help convey here is that these are complementary technologies and, and Cubescape makes it easy from my perspective um, to, to get people excited about security and they can leverage some of the capabilities in Ubuntu and in Charmcase to help them bring them closer to compliance with those controls. So when we really think about summarizing that, the idea is that Charmcase enables low ops management. And then when you place Cubescape on top of that, you have a really great one-stop shop for security. And as David demonstrated, with those open source features that are being built and added all the time, it's a, a pit of success, as we like to say in the industry. And so I think that they, it makes it very compelling for someone to go out there, try Charmcates, pop Kubescape on top, and actually start to think about, oh, security isn't something that's a drag. I can actually start to look at these things in a proactive way and be successful for my solution and for my business. So I hope that you've enjoyed the past half an hour or so with us. I know that we've really enjoyed bringing this to you. I wanted to call out both of the projects. So ubuntu.com slash Kubernetes, you can find Charmcates. And github.com slash Kubescape slash Kubescape, you can find the Kubescape project. There is a wealth of information on both of these links. David and I are accessible as well. And from all of us, I'm sure that you will um, be receiving lots and lots of feedback if you do want to take part in looking at these projects. And a big thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, Vlad. Thank, Thank you, Alex. Alex. Thank you, Vlad. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.